We begin with the worsening humanitarian situation in Sudan. Officials have declared a state of emergency in Khartoum as tens of thousands of people scramble to leave the country. The army and the paramilitary rapid support forces are locked in a power struggle for control. The UN's refugee agency, the UNHCR, says it's expecting almost a third of a million refugees to cross into Chad and South Sudan. Sudan. Britons needing evacuation have been told to make their own way to an airfield near the capital, Khartoum. But it's a perilous journey during a precarious ceasefire, leaving many wary of leaving the relative safety of their homes. All this as several former Sudanese government officials suspected of war crimes have been able to leave prison in Khartoum. Arise News Chief Correspondent John Cookson reports. Only the brave venture out into the almost deserted streets of the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. There's a shaky ceasefire allowing some to go out and look for food and water, but the chances of being shot remains very high. This resident says, we can't leave our homes even if we're told it's safe. Our children go out in the morning to try to find water, but we can't even get water to drink now. We're going to die in our homes, she said. Thousands of foreign nationals evacuated from Sudan are starting to arrive in their home countries. These are families who've made it to Paris. This Frenchman says, what's happening in Sudan is very violent. We've never seen two armies facing each other before, so it's very difficult, but we've been really well taken care of. And this was Jeddah, a Saudi Arabian port on the Red Sea. More than a thousand evacuees from 58 countries have arrived so far. And as they did so, thousands of miles away in New York, there were calls in the UN for the fighting to stop. We need an all-out effort for peace. I call on the parties to the conflict, on Generals Abdel Fattah al-Burham and Mohamed Amdan Daglo, Emeti, and the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces to silence the guns. It is incumbent on Sudanese leaders to put the interests of their people front and center. This conflict will not and must not be resolved on the battlefield with the bodies of Sudan's people. The British government also called on both factions to come to the peace table. I'm encouraged that both factions have called a 72-hour ceasefire, though of course we cannot be sure for how long it will hold. And any evacuation from a battle-scarred city is inherently dangerous. Britain is working hand in glove with our partners across the world. And after this operation, we will do everything possible alongside our friends in the region to secure a lasting settlement for this tragic conflict. For now, Khartoum holds its breath. But what will the two warring generals do when the truce ends? John Cookson, Arise News. Well, Arise East Africa correspondent Mark Bichachi has been monitoring developments and he joins me uh, now live from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Good to see you, Mark. So fear is growing, supplies are running out, but concerns that the ousted leader Omar al-Bashir had escaped have turned out to be unfounded. What more can you tell us about all that? Well, it is interesting that it is true that uh, Harun, uh, one of uh, Bashir's chief lieutenants, has escaped with a number of uh, other uh, senior officials within uh, the Bashir regime. Uh, this is after prisons were uh, one uh, and hundreds of prisoners are known to have escaped, some of them being uh, indeed leaders in the former Bashir regime. Bashir himself is in hospital and his family confirms that he is in a military hospital and has not uh, escaped. Now, what is also interesting is how this war is escalating. There are now reports where we see that uh, businesses, factories are being bombed, businesses are being attacked, and people are actually being chased out of homes, and places are becoming, places of residence are becoming war zones. The uh, battle is getting worse, even with the attack of hospitals today. 
Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Mark, whether this, I mean, how significant this jail break or jail um, release or jail escape is, because uh, that there are some concerns that it could make it tougher to end this conflict if some of the characters who've been released take one side or the other or even start their own fight. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's remember that uh, Bashir led a military-led uh, uh, government. A lot of those people, one, have access to a lot of wealth and power, and second, they have connections within the military on both sides. Let's also remember that a lot of these leaders are parts of uh, different uh, tribal groupings within uh, the Sudan. Uh, if you remember, Emeti is from Darfur and Burhan is from Central Hatum. So already this uh, battle may take on uh, tribal uh, uh, lines. It may take on uh, more uh, uh, different areas of the Sudan. And the more interests that are powerful interests that are there, the more they, it's likely to see more violence. Also remember that Bashir's uh, team was in power hardly five years ago, and the country has not moved much from that. So yes, it is a powder keg uh, waiting to happen. And uh, key international powers, in addition to, of course, evacuating their citizens and their diplomats, still attempting to put pressure on the war generals to extend the ceasefire. Is that looking hopeful at all? Well, given that the ceasefire has not been a complete ceasefire, there have been uh, sporadic uh, uh, battles uh, being recorded. Uh, the issue is that one, the ceasefire is not holding as stably as it should. And two, the two generals are not speaking about having conversations between themselves. They are not talking about a peaceful uh, uh, end to this uh, particular conflict. Instead, they seem to be both convict that one, convicted that one can defeat the other. It is these stances without even giving conditions upon which negotiations can happen that is forcing the diplomatic community to deal with a Sudan that has an exasperating humanitarian condition, um, in expected increased warfare. So uh, right now there seems to be no sign of a let up or an easing of tensions between the two generals. So as you said, Mark, a fragile three-day ceasefire continuing to hold despite intermittent violence. Uh, clashes reported overnight and into the day. Uh, how would you summarize the state of play now? Is anybody getting the upper hand? That's, that has been the golden question. If you were to follow uh, the various leaders on their social media and the various uh, media outlets they are trying to reach, you would think that they are both winning. But it seems as though it is quite the stalemate, given that uh, there is no... Uh, uh, significant change or confirmable change by anyone. If you listen to the statement of the special uh, envoy to Sudan from the UN, uh, he said that there is no way right now to determine who's taking the upper hand because this battle is no longer just about uh, the artillery and gunfire. It is also a big propaganda war where each side is claiming to have made uh, progress. Each side is showing videos of the other uh, 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 surrendering to, to, to their forces uh, and putting their, laying down their arms. So it is a big propaganda war and it is very difficult to determine who has the upper hand. And of course, uh, while uh, many foreign countries, as we mentioned, are safely repatriating their citizens, for local Sudanese, the option to flee is much harder with no assistance. Yes, indeed. In fact, uh, the cost of a bus ride is upwards of between 900 and 1,000 US dollars. You can imagine how out of which is that is for many people. However, we've got above 25,000 people who've gone to Chad. Chad has even requested for extra financing to be able to afford 
uh, to take care of these refugees. We're also seeing many thousands going all the way to Egypt. We know there's even a convoy that is headed to Port Sudan. Many people uh, are, are also looking to head all the way to Saudi Arabia. So this escape is not only expensive, but it's also uh, treacherous because they're talking about the many roadblocks on the way. Many are taking advantage of the ceasefire, which I think is being held by because many countries are trying to evacuate their citizens. But after that, it is anyone's guess. And it is going to be a serious humanitarian crisis, uh, both in Sudan and out of Sudan in countries like, like Chad, where a lot of these refugees are running to. And uh, very briefly, Mark, uh, while this mass departure of diplomats, foreign nationals and ordinary people is uh, taking place, I mean, what might this mean for the future of Sudan? Well, the, the truth is the longer this Sudan conflict continues, the less uh, there will be to salvage. We are already hearing of factories being bombed, infrastructure is being destroyed, and the value of the economy is dropping like a stone in water. So the more they stay at war, the harder also will it be for there to be peace. And let's also remember that in the last decade, nearly every country around the Sudan has experienced turmoil. So this will also mean the geopolitical environment around Sudan could also deteriorate. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Mark Bichachi is a Rise East Africa correspondent and he was talking to me there from Nairobi.